Dr. Jamil, would you come up? So um, thank you for having me this morning and allowing me to give this talk. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the papers. So it's, I've been working on this paper with Dr. Shuck as well as Kevin, who's a, also a research associate with us. And it's entitled The Incidence and Predictive Factors of Metachronous Bilateral RCC. So just to begin with, so we know that bilateral kidney cancer is estimated to occur in approximately one to 2% of the population. Um, from a time standpoint, patients can present with bilateral kidney cancer in two different ways. Patients can either have bilateral kidney disease at the time of presentation, in which case they're known to have synchronous disease, or patients can have a unilateral kidney cancer and then go on to develop a second kidney tumor at some later point, in which case they're termed to have metachronous bilateral kidney disease. Just of note, um, Many people would argue that metachronous disease is actually believed to be related to tumor multifocality and a predisposition to, to the development of multiple tumors and not as a result of metastasis from the primary tumor. So it is important to know who is at risk for the development of these de novo contralateral tumors as this may have significant implications on counseling. Um, for instance, if you know that a patient's at high risk of developing a second contralateral tumor at some other point of time, you may want to consult the patient on having more of a, a, a nephron sparing surgery up front. And then following treatment, you may want to monitor that patient more aggressively. Um, in terms of metachronous disease, it's the overall incidence is believed to be low, about 0.4%. However, the cumulative incidence at 25 years is thought to be about 1.5%. And these numbers are taken from two large population level studies one was a Norwegian study using their own national tumor registry, and the other was one done at Memorial Sloan using, using SEER. Uh, the, the main criticisms of these prior large studies is that they have limitations in their follow-up time, in that they were, they were limited to two to four years of follow-up time, and we know from prior single institutional studies that the median time to developing a second tumor can be up to six years. So we set out to assess the true incidence of metachronous bilateral RCC in a cohort of patients with extensive follow-up. Going into this project, our hypothesis was that the true incidence was actually much higher than previously reported. We assessed the risk factors in a multivariate model and developed a nogram. We calculated age, I mean, adjusted standardized incidence ratios uh, to evaluate the risk of a second RCC in the SEER cohort versus the general population. So we used the SEER tumor registry, and this is a tumor registry that represents about 28% of the U.S. population. It's geographically diverse and is thought to accurately reflect the U.S. on an entire level. Uh, we included patients from 1973 to 2007, and patients had follow-up until 2013. Using SEER, you're, all, you're able to find patients who have multiple primary tumors. However, this is underutilized because it's a very uh, tedious process. In terms of exclusions, we excluded any patient who had less than a year of follow-up, who had a tumor developed within, a second tumor developed within one year, patients who had distant disease at initial diagnosis, non-RCC histology, unknown stage, or unknown tumor laterality. This is just some summary on the st statistical analysis that we performed. So we looked at person years at risk. So this is really just the sum of every year of follow-up. Um, we stratified this, we stratified this by age, gender, and race. We calculated the SIR using age-adjusted rates from SEER. We looked at the cumulative incidence. We performed a multivariate competing risk regression and then developed a nomogram from our regression model. So this is uh, just, a, uh, just a, a summary on the query that I performed. The main take-homes from this slide is that all patients who were included were, had microscopically confirmed RCC. And in total, we had, after our exclusions, we had about 80, we had 80,403 patients. These are the summary results, so 80,000 patients. The median follow-up time in this SEER cohort was 8.3 years. The total person years of follow-up was 656,860. There were a total of 1,063 cases of metachronous events. Uh, we found that race, gender, histology, age, and tumor size differed between groups. So this is a table that summarizes that. So in, the, in your rightmost column that's, that's labeled yes, you see that patients who went on to develop a second metachronous tumor, they're more likely to be black, more likely to be male, 
have papillary tumors, be diagnosed at a younger age, as well as have slightly larger tumor sizes. These are two different graphics. Okay. Yeah. So you said they're most likely to be... They had a higher proportion. In the, so in the group that went on to develop a second tumor, they had a higher proportion of black race, male gender, papillary histologies, being young, they were, and they, were, they had a younger median age and a larger tumor size. And we'll, I'll touch upon this a little bit further. Okay. Um, you didn't control for anything when you look at the statistics, right? It's just a simple. This is, this, is, this is just a summary slide. So we'll look at a multivariate model. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a couple other graphic depictions. The main thing to take away from the graph is that median time to second tumor diagnosis was six years, and 23.1% of patients who went on to develop a second tumor, they were discovered to have their second tumor 10 years after initial diagnosis. From, from the patients who we actually had surgical information for, 18% were actually rendered anephric. You know, one quick thing it doesn't start at zero because in fear, the limitation is you don't know when someone was diagnosed. They were diagnosed with two at the same time, secretive, where they were diagnosed and then they developed it. So as a you know, patient sometimes have one side treated and then they have the other side treated. So to get rid of those patients who weren't treated at the same time, we just said in the first year, those patients who had surgery within that first year are probably those who had bilateral synchronous. So that's why it doesn't start. Yeah. So that's why I guess the, the lowest time we'd have would be one year. So 18% ended up having bilateral radical nephrectomies. This is our cumulative incidence graph. And so the way you inter interpret a cumulative incidence graph is this is regardless of age, gender, race. This is if a patient, say, is 50 years old and they make it, if they're 50 and they make it to 60, what is the incidence that they'll have a second tumor within 10 years? And so 10, 20, 30 year cumulative incidence was 1.5, 3.1, and 4%. 4.7% respectively. I mean, this is nearly three times higher than previous estimates. So, of course, because this doesn't control for anything else, there are going to be some patients who have a higher 10-year risk, some patients who have a lower 10-year risk, and so on. And so, this table kind of delves into that a little bit. So, there's a lot of numbers on this slide, but the main thing to look at is the shaded column that, that says adjusted SIR. And what these numbers represent are it's the risk of the patient in the SEER cohort, the risk of developing a second tumor compared to the general population. And the striking thing about this table is that if you look, for, look at black race, you see that they have a 76-fold increased risk compared to the general matched population of developing a second tumor. The other demographic that stands out is patients who had early onset disease diagnosed, they have a 45-fold risk compared to the general population in developing a second tumor. But regardless of, of demographic, the Is that just because they live longer? So two, two things. They could either live longer, have more time to develop a second tumor, or they could, because they're being diagnosed early, they may have some sort of hereditary kidney right. cancer That's syndrome. Think, but I'm just wondering whether it's just hard to flush that out. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. So, take, so looking at these different demographics, we then went to a multivariate model. And so the parameters that we used in the model included age, tumor size, race, histology, and gender. And what we found to kind of drive a patient towards having a second tumor develop were younger age, black race, papillary histology, and male gender. And next to each variable you see the hazard ratio. And so Oh, and one thing about this, this model, so this was a competing risk regression, and so we made sure to account for patients who, who died of any cause as they would not have the opportunity to go on to develop a second tumor. And taking this model, we converted it to a nomogram. Uh, this is a competing risk nomogram, and we, we included age, gender, histology, race to predict 10-year cumulative incidence. We internally validated this, and this was, the C index was 0 0.66, and so I included a couple examples. So if we have a 50-year-old individual who's male, has a papillary tumor, black race, the total points would be about 160 
and using this nomogram, they'd have a 7% cumulative predicted cumulative incidence of 10 years. Then, if we look at someone who's 70 years old, is female, has a chromophobe tumor, is white, that adds up to about 75, 75 points, and their percent risk is actually less than 1% at 10 years. I think, I think having a nomogram is, in some situations, is helpful for patients because it's easier to say, it's easier to give them a number as opposed to saying your, your risk is 76-fold increase compared to general population. I think it just gives a little bit different uh, of a perspective. Of course, some limitations of the paper. So this is a population database, lack information on past medical history, comorbidities, hereditary cancer syndromes. Tumor histology was not assessed under central pathology review and certainly subject to inter observer disagreement. <clears throat> we were also limited to pathologic diagnosis. So patients who had only radiographic evidence of a second tumor could be missed, and that would actually, that would actually underestimate our total inc incidence. So some take-home points. So 30-year cumulative incidence was 4.7%. That's regardless of, of demographics, but this is significantly higher than previously reported. The SIR, the SIR was significantly increased across stratifications, up to 76-fold. It was very prominent in patients of black race and individuals diagnosed with early onset disease. For cases where radical and partial nephrectomy are both feasible, partial nephrectomy should be strongly considered for individuals at high risk of developing a metachronous contralateral disease. In addition, the, SIR raised, the increased SIR raises the question about whether specific populations should have extended contralateral kidney screening. And so going from there, so just moving forward, so the NCCN advocates five to seven years of surveillance for recurrent disease following treatment for stage one through three RCC. As most distant relapses occur within three, three years, the guidelines provide an appropriate strategy, strategy for detection of recurrence in the vast majority of patients. However, these guidelines do not specifically focus on the development of a de novo contralateral RCC. Our SEER analysis suggests that a significant proportion of contralateral kidney tumors develop after the risk of systemic recurrence has decreased and supports an argument for monitoring beyond current guideline recommendations. Initiating a screening protocol to monitor for a second RCC once the risk of systemic recurrence has decreased may be valuable, especially for at-risk individuals. These include patients who have early onset disease, black race, patients who have papillary tumors, and certainly patients who have a combination <coughs> of those variables. So with that being said, thank you, and certainly open to any comments or suggestions about the paper. Yeah, Henry. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, um, so I was pretty surprised by 18% of patients yeah. being rendered a number. Was there, um, have you been, were you able to look at any uh, I did. I association looked. between the time to diagnosis of recurrence and the likelihood of being rendered a number? So, because that would support your argument that maybe people should be surveilled, right? right. Perhaps if people were, if they were surveilled and it was caught earlier, maybe they could have a partial. They weren't surveilled, it was caught later, they would have a radical. Absolutely. So. I looked, so I looked at all the patients who, who were under, rendered anephric. We didn't include the characteristics of all these patients in the, in the paper because there were some issues. But just to begin with, most of these patients were diagnosed. The vast majority were diagnosed after eight years in this group. Um, they were, their second tumor were more likely to have advanced stage and to be a bigger size. The reason why I didn't include this in the paper is that some of these a good amount of these patients were diagnosed or had their treatments very early on where treatment strategies aren't the same as they were back then as they are now. Um, so they were just more likely to, by their surgeon, to have a second radical nephrectomy. Also, we don't have comorbidity data. So some of these patients may have had ESRD going in and may have not had kidney function to begin with. And so they took them out anyway. Um, we don't know if these patients also had genetic cancer syndrome. So we looked at the we looked at the characteristics, but we didn't comment in the paper just because of the limitations of the database. You know, congratulations, that's great work. Um, <laughs> was there a statistical interaction between uh, African American race and tumor histology? Did you look for that? I wonder if there would be. So there was. So there, a higher percentage of African Americans did have papillary tumor histology. That, that might be what's driving that, yeah. those two uh, discrete uh, risk factors. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, Campbell. Uh, I have a question. So when you get into mining the data, initially from the database, um, as Dr. Shock said, the, the group was initially selected by patients who had uh, been treated. Right? It's, like you, you, it's not actually something like diagnosed with a small renal mass or something like that. Is, is that correct? These are all patients who had some sort of histologically confirmed. Most likely they had surgery, and at the time of the surgery, they had a pathologic diagnosis. I wouldn't assume too many of them had biopsies, but it certainly could. So, the, the, so the second so the patients were then were including the second group of patients who had the pathogenic mm -hmm. Like, were all of those hot system database by also having pathology, or were they identified? Like, maybe there's a whole group of patients that there are tiny little adapters who are not the concrete hot. Maybe that just makes life seem a decent person or a never selected for patients that actually had a procedure. Right, so absolutely. So that's one of the limitations that we talked about. Some, some patients may have had radiographic evidence, but not a pathologically confirmed diagnosis. So that would. Right. The reason it was so for the median the median problem was two years, and they didn't have a lot of Good morning. Um, so my case presentation today is on uh, patient RL, who's a 34-year-old Hispanic female. She presented to the emergency room in October of 2016 uh, with right-sided slank pain, fevers, and chills 24 hours after an nephrostomy tooth was exchanged at an outside facility. Uh, at the time, we didn't know much information about her. Her past medical history was bilateral nephrolithiasis, uh, recurrent ETIs. She had a history of ovarian cyst removal and a uh, left uteroscopy laser lipid trips in 2008 at an outside facility. Um, social history, she was a non-smoker. She did not drink alcohol. She was on oxycodone and oxybutynin for, uh, for the uh, nephrostomy tube and uh, for GU symptoms. Uh, family history, she had no history of GU malignancy in the family. Uh, on review of systems, it, uh, this was negative except for uh, what was mentioned above. Uh, negative for hematuria, negative for frequency or dysuria or urgency. Uh, her presentation at the time, she was febrile to 103 and tachycardic to 108. Uh, blood pressure was normal and uh, respiratory rate of 18. 
We, we don't know yet. So she, this is just her presentation in the ED. This is what, what we know from what we saw. Um, she's alert but diaphoretic. Uh, her abdomen was soft, non-tender, non-descended. She had some mild pubic tenderness. Um, her back, uh, on her back exam, she had a right nephrostomy tube in place. The tract appeared well. Uh, she had some slight uh, tenderness to palpation uh, in the right flank and some right-sided CVA tenderness. On labs, her creatinine was 0.7, and that was her baseline. Her crit was uh, 33.2, her baseline 35, a white count of 7.8. Her UA showed uh, just large blood, positive loops, negative nitrites, 22 WBCs, and 10 RBCs. There were no bacteria and no epithelial cells. This was her CAT scan from uh, that we were, this was later, we were able to obtain some outside imaging. So this is her CAT scan from uh, earlier in the year when she had her tube uh, placed after, just after tube placement. So a couple of things here, but uh, that were more apparent actually on the coronals, but there's some thickening of the urethelium. Uh, where's the mouse? Some thickening of the urethelium, some slight enhancement, there's some stones in the kidney. Um, there's also some calcifications kind of lining the, uh, the calyces. And you see some ca uh, calcifications up here. There's some band-like uh, uh, hypoattenuation areas. And a very small kidney compared to her left side. Uh, so this demonstrated calcification outlines, uh, uh, basically what I mentioned. Um, the right ureter was also noted to be narrowed, um, and there were some filling defects that they noted possibly related to hemorrhage um, in the upper uh, cortices, or, or in the upper um, calyces. The left kidney was normal. <laughs> so she was admitted for pyelonephritis. She was started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, she had improvement. She was discharged home on hospital day three. Her urine culture did not grow out anything. What's that? She, this is, yeah, this is, um, we were following in-house, but I'll get to the, um, the outside stuff that we were able to obtain. Um, her blood culture did grow, um, one of the two bottles grew streptococcus mitis, but this was thought to be a contaminant. She was treated with a course of ciprofloxacin, and she was sent home. So during the hospital course, she did have medical records obtained from an outside, uh, from her outside physicians, from ID and urology. Uh, this demonstrated that she presented initially with gross hematuria and clots in February of 2016. She had a CT urogram at the time that demonstrated moderate to se severe right hydronephrosis, and she was actually started on CBI. Uh, she underwent cystoscopy with clot evacuation and a bladder biopsy from the right bladder posterior wall, uh, just posterior to her ureteral orifice, her right trigone, and, and uh, she was also noted to have some, uh, some uh, abnormal appearing, uh, an abnormal appearing right ureteral orifice and had ureteral washings from the right. Her bladder biopsy came back positive for necrotizing granulomatous cystitis with rare acid fast bacilli on the AFB stain. Um, this was, uh, her right ureteral washing was negative for malignant cells. There were clusters of reactive urothelial cells with acute and chronic inflammation. And her right kidney urine culture was positive uh, for mycobacterium tuberculosis ultimately. So she was started on isoniazid, ethambutol, rifampin, and pyridoxine. Um, she had a percutaneous nephrostomy tube placed in June of 2016 uh, for flank pain. And this was her uh, retrograde pyelogram. They were unable uh, to relieve. She initially had a stent placed, but they were unable to relieve her symptoms of her right-sided flank pain with the stent. Um, they, this was done initially on cysto, her retrograde pyelogram, which basically shows a small bifid uh, renal pelvis here. And then um, multiple infundib infundibular strictures and several non-draining calyces uh, with sites of stenosis that were pretty unclear. Uh, this was an anti-grade nephrostogram that was done at an outside facility. We didn't have a read on this, but it appeared that there was no drainage in anti-grade uh, manner going from the nephrostomy tube down, uh, down the ureter. Um, on follow-up, she had a, uh, uh, sh the questions that remained unanswered were, what was her uh, renal function in the right side? and what was her degree of obstruction, and what was the status of the GUTB. So the plan to address these questions at the time uh, was to obtain a MAG3 renal scan with no Lasix, because we were not trying to see if she was uh, clearing from that side with the nephrostomy tube in place. We were trying to assess her kidney function comparatively. Uh, we wanted to repeat our anti-grade nephrostogram with the interventional radiologist here. 
We wanted to repeat her AFB from her voided urine and urine from the nephrostomy tube. Uh, cystoscopy and repeat biopsy was not felt to be of clinical significance after discussion with the ID team, so that was not pursued. Um, and she was sent to establish care with infectious disease at Yale. So what, how, why is it important to figure out her split function? Just to see how much damage the, uh, the kidney, basically if she's having right-sided flank pain and the kidney is non-functioning, she's chronically infected and she's got GUTB, um, can they eliminate the source of the infection and does she need an nephrectomy? Let's say it was 40% function. Well, if there's 40 degree function, then I guess it's more important to see what the clearance would be and whether we need to address, for example, if there's a UPJ obstruction or um, whether there's something else going on that's not allowing her normally functioning kidney, or almost normally functioning kidney to, to not drain. Why do you think her kidney is obstructed? Um, probably from stricture disease, from uh, in, infection, inflammation. Um, it could also be UPJ obstruction that was, you know. Like right. So this but, may be um, cost strictures, I think is what Dr. Hoden is asking. In what direction? I'm sorry. Uh, it was. Oh, um, well, this, this woman had longitudinal strictures, basically affected her, almost her entire ureter. I think that's how it can. I think it starts proximal with the mandibular stenosis, goes down to the pelvis, uh, UPJ and down the ureter. So proximal, it always starts proximally mm -hmm. because it's a renal disease and it comes distally. I think from the pictures, do you think it was more in the mandibular than the stenosis picture? But it's the question is, but even if she had, it's a good function of that kidney. Like, mm -hmm. how are you going to be able to fix this? It'll be very difficult. Right. Such a proximal issue. So, right. So, what are this academic pursuit? You know, you got the symptoms. You know, what's this, what are the symptoms and the, the solution to the problem? Mm -hmm. so. so, if I mean, if her kidney was well functioning, um, I guess you could you could remove it and you know reimplant it. It's not a, it's a proximal. Right, right it's a problem. Sort of oh, I see, I see. When you're, yeah, in fundibular structure, yeah, that I, I mean, I'm not sure how you would fix that. That's. <laughs> Drugs. <laughs> That's the. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, so she was, okay, so she was sent to establish care with infectious disease. Um, this was her MAG3, basically. Uh, demonstrating that there was some uptake of tracer on the on that side on the left side or sorry on the right side um, there was uptake however it was there was delayed corticomedullary transit um, and you do see prompt drainage from the contralateral side down the ureter and into the bladder but this side was not did not drain uh, all that well they did see a little bit of drainage I believe let me see on the subsequent slide so the differential renal function, um, it was uh, the left was eighty four point three percent, the right was fifteen uh, percent. There should be a drainage issue, right? Right. It's a, right. She has an nephrostomy tube in, and right. They were not really assessing drainage; they were assessing function here. Um, so the T, uh, well, let's see. Basically, the left uptake was eighty four point three percent. Right uptake was fifteen point seven percent. And. Uh, Right, there was drainage seen uh, from the nephrostomy tube. The right ureter was not identified, and the left kidney was normal. So interventional radiology, Dr. Pollock um, actually um, repeated her anterior nephrostogram. So this was, this was the image, these were the images that he obtained for us. There was really no flow into the right ureter, and uh, fewer calyces than were expected were visualized. And he actually noted um, when he instilled Die, the dye almost refluxed immediately back into the syringe. Um, so GUTB, this is the third most common uh, site of extrapulmonary TB. Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis of the lungs can be carried to the lymph nodes and then delivered into the venous blood, which can lead to seeding of different organs. Um, granulomas then form at the site of metastatic foci. Um, in the GU system, you have multi uh, metastatic foci are typically bilateral, cortical, and adjacent to glomeruli. Um, these may remain inactive for decades. Uh, clinical, clinically significant disease is only caused by capillary rupture and delivery of the bacilli into the proximal tubules. And this typically occurs only in one kidney. In the renal collecting system, you have uh, growing granulomas that may erode and spread the bacilli into the renal pelvis, ureters, and uh, bladder. 
And the result is development of fibrosis, strictures, and chronic abscesses, and uh, can also result in basically an autonephrectomy. Ureteral TB causes strictures and hydronephrosis, and some cases of stricture uh, form within the entire ureter. Um, as far as bladder TB, this is secondary to renal TB. So you have, like you were saying before, you basically have proximal um, infection that drains downward and you spread it uh, from the ureter into the bladder. Um, this is a superficial inflammation with bullous edema and granulation. This involves typically the UVJ. Uh, you may have um, some vesicoureteral reflux in those cases or hydronephrosis, a golf hole appearance of the ureteral orifice or ureteral orifice strictures. Um, it can involve the entire bladder wall and the muscle could be replaced by fibrous tissue um, leading to a fibrous bladder. Presentation, um, uh, these patients present with flank pain, hematuria, frequency, urgency, bladder symptoms. They may have sterile pyuria and proteinuria. A CT urogram and voiding cystography are typically done. Um, these demonstrate infundibular stenosis as with this patient, multiple ureteral strictures. Uh, there may be cortical necrosis, calcifications, cavitary lesions with scarring, strictures, sinus or abscess formations. Um, and sometimes in very severe cases that affect the bladder, you can have a very small and contracted bladder. It can be easily misdiagnosed. So the first, um, these, there wasn't much literature on GUTB except, uh, you know, misdiagnosis and uh, case reports of misdiagnosis. Um, also, uh, another paper that I'll review after this regarding um, removing the kidney. Um, but GUTB, um, in this case, masqueraded as a ureteral calculus. This is a 37-year-old male uh, with flank pain and hematuria, which, who was referred for treatment for a presumed left ureteral stone seen on KUB. A CAT scan uh, demonstrated left hydronephrosis and calocele calcific calcifications, septated cystic lesions, and no ureteral stone. A UA demonstrated seropyuria and had a positive AFB and uh, micro uh, a tuberculosis on PCR. So they were unable to find the ureteral orifice during the cysto and uh, subsequently a nephrostomy tube was placed. He underwent a left radical nephrectomy after several months of TB treatment and pathology demonstrated an active necrotizing granulomatous inflammation and acid fast, was acid fast positive. So these are very rare and difficult diagnoses in the Western world. Um, we have to maintain a high index of suspicion. I think in this case, this patient came, was a prison guard from um, Southeast Asia. So I think they, you know, put, Put that in context also. Um, did he have pulmonary TB or not? He did not have pulmonary TB, but he had a history of um, testing positive, I believe, on uh, for having had it. Um, this paper was uh, about um, indications for surgical management and what uh, circumstances do you want to intervene and how do you intervene. Um, so these were operative management categories, drainage for hydronephrosis or drainage for abscesses or caverns, um, would, uh, definitive local treatment of kidney tuberculosis such as with partial nephrectomy, reconstruction of the upper urinary tract uh, or bladder augmentation, uh, because of the effect on the, on the uh, bladder, reconstruction of the urethra, or management of uh, general TB, such as epididymal or orchiectomy. Um, so medical, the, the bottom line was basically medical treatment must always be undertaken first, and it must be continued concurrently. <clears throat> um, in emergency cases that require immediate surgical intervention, uh, these are patients with bilateral hydronephrosis or hydronephrosis of a solitary or functioning sol solitary kidney worsening renal insufficiency or septic complications. Um, you could either drain them, drain them with a double J stent or a percutaneous nephrostomy tube. Uh, when stenting is not possible, you place a perc tube. And you may need multiple nephrostomy tubes, like as you were saying with the infundibular stenosis, sometimes you put a, a tube in one uh, calyx, but you're not draining the rest of the kidney because the other calyces are obstructed. So you may need multiple tubes. Um, with advanced ureteral stenosis, stenting is a treatment of choice before complete stenosis, and then you combine with anti-TB medications and corticosteroids. As far as indications for nephrectomy, um, if the kidney is destroyed by cases to decay, uh, determined by MAG3 clearance, um, if there is destruction of at least two calyces, alteration of at least uh, two-thirds of the renal parenchyma or both, um, you typically move towards performing reconstructive operations and nephron sparing sur surgery in cases of TB, which uh, may not be compatible with the goal to shorten uh, any anti-TB medication duration. 
As far as uh, reconstruction of the UPJ, this is much more difficult for TB stenosis than congenital. Did you come across a description of a classic picture of a KUB of what a TB infected unit is called and what it looks like? Um, see it in an undeveloped world very frequently, probably. I did see pictures. I, I don't remember what it's called. A putty kidney. Has anybody heard of a putty kidney? It's like nephrocalcinosis, and it's basically like caseous sac of necrotic inflamed kidney that doesn't work. But you see it on a KUB basically, and it's just full of stones. What's our obligation? So you diagnose sort of GUTB, like assess for pulmonary status, or how, mm -hmm. what's our obligation? Disseminated right. So she had had. She was. She did not have any TB in the lungs, and she must have previously had TB in the lungs that spread. But at this point in time, and even when she was diagnosed, there was no sign of active TB in her lungs. So that had been established before she came to us. That was established by her. She was also being watched by because it was one of the diseases that you have to submit to the state department. So they, I mean, they had monitored her and cleared her kid her uh, lungs previous to all of this happening <laughs> so uh, patient uh, rl we did a lap nephrectomy on december 8th um, she had very torturous parasitic vessels abutting the kidney um, she had enlarged an enlarged paracaval lymph node which was just uh, reactive uh, uh, the gonadal vein and the ureter were, were taken with a staple the hilum had two veins and two arteries and uh, they were basically taken with the staple um, the kidney uh, was removed through a fan and steel incision, which she had previously had for her ovarian cyst removal. So we went through the same incision um, and we put it in an endo catch bag to remove it. The pathology showed that the renal uh, parenchyma uh, demonstrated ac acute and chronic inf uh, inflammation. There was necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. The AFB and, and GMS uh, uh, stains were negative for mycobacteria and fungal organisms. Probably, I assume it was probably because she's been treated so long with anti-TB medications. This was going on, you know, month 10 of treatment. Um, An AFB, uh, sorry, PCR for mycobacterium was still pending at the time. Um, she had two benign lymph nodes, and then she was seen in follow-up in January. She was doing well. Right, kidney. It was just, and we just came across it. We identified it and came across it. I know it's it. We came across it in order to get the kidney out. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, so for our last presentation, I'll be presenting on uh, port site metastasis and renal cell carcinoma. Uh, this is not a case from this institution. So why is this an important topic? Uh, in gallbladder cancer, uh, port site metastasis has been shown to be as high as 14 to 30%. Um, I know this is an older article. Uh, for gynecological and colorectal cancers, uh, it has been shown to be about 4 to 5%. There have been 16 case reports of renal cell carcinoma and poor site metastasis. Uh, this is from an article that was published in the Journal of Urology in 2014. And from that article, uh, the authors concluded that about the one-year probability of survival is 31.8% after um, the development of poor site metastasis. So I'm going to start out with a case presentation. I'm going to talk about theories of why this may happen. I'm going to go uh, give an overview of 16 cases of renal cell carcinoma and uh, the development of poor site metastasis. And then I'm going to give uh, ideas about prevention. So the uh, case I'm going to present um, comes from an article uh, out of uh, Washington University at St. Louis, um, which is a 68-year-old man with a history of diabetes initially incidentally discovered to have a right renal mass with an nephrometry score of 10A. Uh, uh, there was no radiological evidence of lymph node involvement or distant metastasis. The patient underwent a biopsy. Uh, he was shown to have uh, a T1A clear cell, Furman grade three RCC. 
it was 3.9 centimeters. Uh, he underwent a robotic-assisted partial nephrectomy in October of 2011. During the resection, the mass was not obviously violated. Uh, a specimen bag was used, and there was no specimen morselation. The extraction site was reapproximated at the fascia, subcutaneous tissue was irrigated, and the skid edges were reapproximated using a stapling device. The patient came back in March of 2012 um, with a follow-up CT that showed a 1.7 meter, um, seven centimeter mass located on the abdominal wall. He um, then underwent laparoscopic removal. This is the uh, metastasis here at one of the former port sites. So what are some of the thoughts as to why this may happen? Um, one thought is it may have to do with the biological aggressiveness of the tumor. Um, Fermin grades may have a significant impact on port site and overall incidence of tumor occurrences. Um, of all the cases that were associated um, with port site METs, uh, intermediate, intermediate or high grade tumors uh, from in grade two or higher. Um, it's thought that uh, local wound factors may pay, play a role in the development of port site metastasis. Cancer cells have a high proliferation potential uh, within the healing skin incision. Um, tumor cells may implant more successfully during early wound staging, adhering to fibrin at the site of the surgical trauma um, as a part of normal healing. The presence of growth factors at the wound site may promote um, the survival and propagation of cancer cells. Uh, repair at the trocar entry site may reduce the risk of tumor implantation and subsequent reoccurrence. Um, it's thought that maybe the immune function of the patients themselves may play a role in the development of port site metastasis. Uh, and immune function is diminished during the perioperative period because of anesthetic agents, opioids, surgical trauma, blood transfusions have been shown, uh, temperature changes, pain, psychological stress, uh, in animal models, surgical trauma has been shown to reduce the natural killer cell activity and promote tumor cell metastasis. Um, this is just, uh, this comes from the same article. It, it looked at, this wasn't the 16 cases that were overall presented, but it looked at um, some of the uh, evidence, some, some of the patients that had uh, port site mets and it showed some of their comorbidities. Um, some patients didn't have any comorbidities. Um, another possibility is that the authors talked about CO2, um, or CO2 insufflation. Um, this may have an impact on the movement of tumor cells within the cavity and um, subsequent implantation at the port site METs. Um, there's a threefold incidence of port site METs and hamster models of tumor cell suspension and laparoscopy versus laparotomy. Uh, aspiration of tumor, cell, tumor cells during CO2 laparoscopy, but not number of intraperitoneal tumor cells um, needed is extremely high. Before I go on, I kind of want to point out um, one thing about a lot of these articles that I'm presenting is that if, if you look at the dates, uh, they're all from the 90s and the early 2000s. There really hasn't been a lot of data recently within the last 12 or 13 years on this topic. Um, and as I'll also go on to tell, a lot of the, the cases that we'll talk about today are sort of in the early 2000s and haven't been as of recent. Another thought is uh, the chimney effect. Um, there may be continued leakage of gas around and through the trocar site, um, which results in cumulative buildup of tumor cells at the port site. Uh, tissue trauma um, combined with uh, leakage of CO2 may lead to enhanced tumor growth. Uh, the CO2 itself may stimulate tumor growth, um, and this can be with interfering with local defense me mechanisms such as TNF-alpha. Mm -hmm. Uh, abdominal wound uh, tumors developed in a significant greater number of animals in CO2 group when compared with helium. And um, again, this is just showing uh, lower pH and that carbon dioxide may stimulate uh, local defense or a negative impact on local defense mechanisms. And then lastly, uh, tumor cell transfer. Aggressive manipulation of the tumor with laparoscopic instruments. Uh, withdrawal insertion of these contaminated instruments, irrigating port sites with um, betadine at the completion of the case may help in preventing um, port site mets. Um, there was also one study that looked at using methotrexate and cyclophosphamide, which may be a little um, more expensive of a prevention technique. Uh, an entrapment bag, which is now pretty much universally used um, in surgery, has been um, shown to be maybe helpful in presenting port site mets and we no longer morselate uh, specimens, but um, that has been shown um, potentially in uh, gynecological cancers in the past. So there was an article that, that I alluded to earlier that was published in the Journal of Urology in 2014, 
Um, it looked at all 16 cases of renal cell carcinoma in the development of port site metastasis. Um, and what the authors did is they looked at all, all, all cases until the year 2013. Um, 16 cases met their criteria. Uh, patients either went laparoscopic or robotic surgery, um, and only eight of the authors were available for comment. Um, this is just an overview showing the different types of uh, procedures that patients had. Uh, if they had clear cell, papillary, or chromophobe, mean time to presentation um, for port site METs was 16 months, uh, and the average for the median was 11. In terms of identifi identifiable causes, uh, authors pointed to specimen morselation, lack of, a, of an entrapment to, um, bag, uh, tumor rupture, and nine of the cases showed no technical issues. In terms of how these patients were treated, um, seven patients had widespread disease, nine had only port site mets. Um, of those nine, seven underwent tumor excision, one underwent radiation and chemo, and one underwent radiation. Of the ones with uh, widespread disease, um, one receives attentive plus radiation, one died prior to treatment, and the other three did not have any data. Mean follow-up was 28 months. Um, survival outcome was unavailable for five cases, but of four of the patients um, presented with widely metastatic disease, um, from the other 11 cases where they were able to have data, the one year's um, survival probability was 31.8%, which is a pretty low number of patients, but that's what the authors concluded. Um, so I, I think it, depending on um, the patient's comorbidities, they felt that they may have been not a great surgical candidate to, to go back in and, and extract the tumor based on. What role does radiation play in the management of renal uh, usually, I, For the most part, we don't use it unless we can do it for, for metastasis, I think sometimes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of prevention, uh, rigorous adherence to oncological surgical techniques with minimal handling of the tumor, uh, trocar fixation, avoidance of gas leakage around the trocar site, uh, intact extraction or morselation within an impermeable bag under direct vision, and then possible uh, beta-9 irrigation of the laparoscopic instruments and port site wounds when appropriate. So in summary, um, there's been a higher incidence of port site meds when laparoscopic surgery was first introduced. Uh, the overall incidence now is about less than 1% um, and is likely not a contraindication considering the benefits of laparoscopic surgery. Uh, there have been 16 cases of um, port site meds with renal cell carcinoma. And then in terms of etiology, um, as I discussed earlier, <coughs> biological aggressiveness, uh, specimen morselation, entrapment bag may help uh, local wound factors, CO2 stimulation, chimney effect, immune function. And in terms of prevent prevention, minimal handling, trocar fixation. Um, bag use, betadine, and tech extraction. Sure. Uh, nice job. I just wanted to address Peruzzo's question. So I, mean, I think, so we use radiation for renal cell metastases um, in the brain, um, highly effective, um, typically in bone, but it's not really, you don't typically think of radiation that, for like a solitary soft tissue metastasis. Okay. And you know, these people, Presumably, since it's a port site metastasis, we're all surgical candidates in the relatively recent past. Mm -hmm. You'd imagine that they would be surgical candidates at the same time. I, typically, you know, this is something that would be managed surgically. Okay. Some radiation oncologists, I mean, I, 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 you know, it's certainly not the, the standard of care, but, but you know, the answer that radiation oncologists have given, and I've seen cases where they have treated, is that every tissue is radiosensitive if you get enough radiation and you can target it well. So, so, I mean, people do are willing to target some solitary lesions in patients who are not surgical candidates. So, what could be more superficial than a portrait? Correct. I, 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 I mean, it's interesting also the, the totality of the case, 16 cases. I didn't see who all the authors were, but I mean, there's probably, you know, you, you wonder what some of the, the, the motivation is about this. I mean, there's probably more than 16 patients who fell off the table having laparoscopic surgery. I mean, what is the denominator? I mean, how many laparoscopic? Or robotic kidney. I mean, we're probably talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases, so yeah, far less than one percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of bring, brings up my point, and that is to put it in perspective. I mean, do you have any sense of how often this occurs with open surgery, where you get implants at the um, at the open site? I mean, to put it, 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 it yeah. seems like a very low number. It, mm -hmm. 
I, I mean, I don't think it's a contraindication to laparoscopic yeah. surgery. It's just, I, I just think that, you know, where it's happened in the past and so authors have discussed it, I thought it may be interesting to talk about in terms of uh, metastasis to the X lab site. I'm not, I, I'm not hundred percent sure. And theoretically, it probably does happen too. If there's some yeah. These are all, you think they're all partial cases? Partial number Yeah. So it's radical. We've seen a couple, couple of patients with various stolas like that have had like radicals, and I don't know if it's just tumor disruption, but um, with hand assisted, when you don't use a band, I don't know, it, it just could be maybe being rough on the tumor, not from our institution, but outside. You know, when they pull through the bag, I have a picture of Chopin, and they're like a 20 centimeter recurrence in their report site. I just think you just need to be careful there. It's really more tumor specific. Most of the small renal masses we operate on are really indolent, and we probably don't need to be treated, but it's really more of these kind of math. I don't know, uh, you know, they, they really went detailed in histology, but the, really the papillary and papillary type 2 are the ones which I think you're more likely to have this kind of uh, event happen. So, Juan, I look a lot at this, you know, back in the 90s when this all came about. I, I really think that this is kind of it's just this is more historical than anything else. Mm -hmm. I think in the uh, 90s when laparoscopy was burgeoning, I think there was a concern when we did see this. And it really was based, number one, on the aggressiveness of the tumor. So, PCC was actually had a higher rate of um, port site metastasis. If you, real, if you think back, there was a lot of lymph node dissections being done for prostate cancer in the early to mid 90s. A huge number, almost none, had port site metastasis. So it's the aggressiveness of the tumor can lead to port site metastasis. I think early on, it basically, I think it's all due to surgical skill. Yeah. And I think it was just the during the evolution of the learning curve of laparoscopy, mm -hmm. there was a mishandling of the tissue, whether it's done open laparoscopic. And I think that, put, and based on the aggressiveness of the tumor, that can lead to port site metastasis. So you know, going back to um, you know what what is really the the uh, denominator here. I think now it's a very rare event. I think the skill levels improved and I think everyone's realized that, you know, care and take, managing the, the tumor is key. And so if you cut into the tumor and it's an aggressive tumor, regardless of whether it's done open or laparoscopic, it's going to see. I think people were really concerned back in the 90s whether there was some secondary effect of the environment. So CO2, pneumo, just I don't think that's being borne out. Yeah, I mean, there's not, not a lot of data. Um, you know, from the pediatric perspective, a little bit of literature and Wilms, uh, um, you know, untreated Wilms will see this a rupture. But if you look at the literature on Wilms that have been done laparoscopically and partial done on those Wilms, there have been no reports of seeding. Why does all those patients get pre op Wilms? And so the tumor has been basically nullified at that point. So it goes to your point that it was the severity of the rest of the 